The Untold History, a podcast by the Hispanic Council with the collaboration of the Spanish Ministry of Defense to get to know great Spanish figures in the history of the United States. Today, Juan Rodriguez Caprillo. Only Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo guessed that the profession of being a carpenter learned in his hometown of Palma del Rio would open the doors of wealth, honor, and glory to him. In order to join Pedro Arias's company, Juan used his ability to close the joints of the ship's woods with oak and tar so that water would not enter. The expedition left San Lucar de Barameda on April 11, 1514. It was composed of 22 ships and about a thousand men. Among them, Caprillo, who was 17 years old at the time. Spain had just discovered America in 1492. No matter how unnoticed one tried to pass in the New World, it was inevitable to appear with first and last names in some chronicle of the time. The young Cabrillo, who was not just anyone, was praised by Bernal Diaz del Castillo. He says of him, among other things, that he was a good soldier in the Mexican business. With the Mexican business, the chronicle referred to the conquering feat of Hernán Cortés, in which our protagonist played a role and not a minor one. After surviving the sad night and fighting in the Battle of Otumba, Cabrillo was one of the Spaniards who took refuge in Tlaxcala. There, under the orders of Martín López, he participated in the construction of 13 brigantines that, duly dismantled, were moved to the Texcoco Lagoon, from where they left for the capture of Tenochtitlan, foundational milestone of the conquest of Mexico. The conquering goals of Cabrillo did not stop there. They continued with their incursion in Central American lands under the orders of Pedro de Alvarado, founder of the first capital of Guatemala, a company in which Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo also stamped his signature. In 1532, 18 years after he left, Cabrillo returned to Spain. Did he return to enjoy the wealth he had acquired with his courage and his sword? No, he returned to get married after that, he returned to Guatemala, where he continued to prosper with the construction of ships, commerce, and mining. Until 1540, when Pedro de Alvarado, governor of Guatemala and old companion of fatigues, asked him to participate in a new adventure that would have as destination, at first, the species or Moluccas Islands. In New Spain, Governor Alvarado met with Viceroy Antonio de Mendoza, both agreed to divide the fleet. Part of the ships, under the orders of Rui Lopez de Villalobos, would sail to the Moluccas. The other, under the command of Pedro de Alvarado, would explore the northern coast of the Pacific. When Alvarado was about to leave, he received news that the governor of Jalisco was surrounded by natives. So he went to his aid. He would not return. He died in combat. Foreseeing the fatal outcome, Alvarado had entrusted the company to Cabrillo. Viceroy Mendoza would confirm Cabrillo in his charge. On June 27, 1542, the fleet, composed of two Naos, the Victoria and the San Salvador, set sail from the port of Navidad. It was not the first nautical company to venture into the waters of the North Pacific. Hernán Cortés had already sponsored four campaigns. Finding out if there was a channel that connected the two great oceans was one of the main objectives. Another was the discovery of wealth. Antonio de Mendoza, the first viceroy of New Spain, continued Cortés's efforts. If the expedition sponsored by Mendoza did not find the desired interoceanic passage, nor gold, at least it would exceed the geographic limit reached in 1539 by Francisco de Ulloa. To this navigator, we owe the discovery of the Island of the Cedars. Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo would surpass him by far. During its voyage, the expedition discovered, named, and mapped ports, islands, capes, bays, towns, and mountain ranges. 
It also came into contact with native tribes, noting their uses and customs, as well as descriptions of the flora and fauna of the places they inhabited. Being the first Europeans to see a white chamois must have amazed them. Similarly to when the men of Vasquez de Coronado verified the existence of some strange cows with a hump, of which had given testimony Alvar Nunez, the bison. Caprillo's expedition also recorded currents and storms, and not only that, he suffered them. Caprillo also suffered a fall that resulted in a broken arm that caused a fatal infection, dying on January 3, 1543. Before expiating, he appointed Bartolome Ferraro as head of the expedition, with the task of not giving up on his discovery efforts. Ferraro complied with this task. On February 28th, after Cape Mendocino, the expedition reached the southern surroundings of Cape Blanco, which until then had been the biggest mark achieved by European ships. The cold, storms, scurvy, and shortage of food forced the return. On April 14, 1543, the expedition arrived at the Christmas port, from where it had departed almost a year earlier. The crew arrived exhausted, empty-handed, and without any interoceanic passage, an absolute failure by the standards of the time. Until half a century later, pirates like Drake and Cavendish boasted of having discovered what is now Upper California. Then Spain regained interest in the North Pacific, dusting off the roots, maps, diaries, and stories of Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, that native of Palma del Rio, who, while still a young carpenter, dreamed of worlds to be discovered.